sort of contribute to the ambiance, but. Oh. Um, so anyway, thanks for coming out, um, and thanks to Urban Hive. I hope you all, did everybody have a chance to enjoy that delicious spread we had up there? Yes. Yes. My goodness, I think that was like like healthy and delicious, and like just, I was ashamed to take food because they all looked so beautiful. So um, anyway, a big thanks to the 24K Cafe for bringing that food out here uh, tonight. Yeah, please. So uh, as you are live tweeting and sharing about all the fun things that are going on here tonight, please be sure to mention the Urban Hive and 24K Cafe and uh, all the great people that help us to be hospitable uh, to you all. So we want to uh, definitely uh, share about them and their contributions. Uh, speaking of which, I also want to say thank you uh, to Carrie Shearer. He's the Brilliant red-headed gentleman right there behind all that gear. <laughs> Carrie is uh, live streaming our event tonight, uh, bringing our event live to all the folks on the, uh, on the internet. So um, it's actually a great deal of work, so we're thankful uh, for Carrie and his contribution uh, there. So how many of you, if this is your first time at the social media club? Awesome. That's a huge number, liar. <laughs> All right, so um, fantastic. Briefly, uh, the Social Media Club, we're a nonprofit, volunteer uh, operated organization. We have no staff. We are a local chapter of a global uh, organization with hundreds of chapters on uh, six continents. Uh, if anybody wants to start the Antarctica um, <laughs> branch, uh, welcome to do so. But uh, great organization. Uh, we are, uh, we do offer memberships. So if social media is your job and you just live and breathe social media, you want to connect with other people who are living and breathing social media, and you maybe even want to join our leadership team and help uh, with the board, we would love <coughs> to talk to you about membership. Um, because we do offer those uh, here locally. Um, but the great thing is it's not required, right? We don't charge uh, for these events. They're open to the public. And we're really glad that you all uh, could come and join us. So uh, while you're tweeting uh, tonight, the hashtag for this event is SMCSAC. So you can use that. You can follow the conversation on your cell phones, your iPads, your laptops, whatever else you uh, brought. Um, and uh, and definitely keep that going. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce David Carr, who's actually a uh, public relations specialist with VSP. He's actually going to be our moderator tonight, and he'll. Uh, my name is David Carr, as he said, um, with VSP Global. Um, most of you probably are more familiar with VSP Vision Care if you have vision benefits with us. Um, a uh, little bit about myself, I uh, work in the public relations department doing primarily social media uh, strategy, um, focus a lot on the vision care benefits consumer uh, social media. Um, I also, though, am responsible for the public relations for BSP's eye health management program, which essentially is, <coughs> excuse me, essentially is our internal program dedicated to the early detection and treatment of chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension um, through eye exams. Um, so I think that background will provide a nice foundation uh, for me to moderate tonight. Um, I will allow the panelists to introduce themselves as I'm sure they can do a better job than I. Well, great. Uh Thanks for having me. My name is uh, Dr. Davis Liu. I'm actually a practicing primary care doctor with Kaiser Permanente. Uh, today, my uh, opinions and pieces are actually mine and not that <laughs> of Kaiser Permanente, so I don't want anyone to have a perception of that. Um, but I've actually uh, self-published two books and uh, a blog, and I tweet. And the reason for that, really, and we can talk more about that, is really a way of two things. One, um, patient empowerment, giving people the tools and information they need in a system that's increasingly more <laughs> complex, frightening, and frankly, just confusing. And the other part is actually to engage uh, physician leaders also to make sure that we've got to make our system even better. So that's kind of my role and I'm really thrilled to be here and look forward to the conversation this evening. 
I'm Liz Salmi. Um, on here it says I am a brain cancer blog and a blogger and young adult cancer survivor, and that's true. I actually have brain cancer, and I got into write, uh, writing about my experience through my own blog, and then from there, just communicating with more patients who are finding me. And um, actually, I bought Dr. Liu's book. It's really good, so you should all check that out. <laughs> and I think, um, and how I use social media is through blogging, using Twitter, Facebook, and uh, talking about patient advocacy. Um, my situation might be kind of confusing. Uh, my name is Christian Hollingsworth. Um, my company, Smart Boy Designs, handles all the social media for Susan G. Komen, Sacramento, a bunch of different other health companies and clients and things like that. Um, but here tonight, I don't officially represent Komen, but I do. <laughs> um, so, so just bear with me tonight. Um, I've been blogging since I was really, really young, started my company really young. Um, you know, things like Triber online, if you've ever heard of Triber, um, I helped the organizer, Dino Dogan, get that all started when it first came out. And a lot of different things like that, which have seen um, the growth of social media, and I've been able to take place in that. Um, so it's exciting for me to be here. Great. Again, thanks for having me. I'm Katie Krebs with a uh, team in training for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. I think I'm here actually representing the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, as far as I know. Um, and um, basically, the, the main social media outlet we use is probably similar to all of yours, face, the Facebook machine. Um, and basically using that to drive traffic to awareness, recruitment, and um, patient services. A lot of people are unaware of our patient services department and that branch of what we do. So um, we're having a really interesting position right now as an organization of trying to unify our four campaigns as far as branding is concerned on the social media platforms, but also in all of our print collateral and things. So um, it's kind of an interesting time for us right now and figuring out how to drive that traffic. And like we were talking about earlier, where to drive it, why we're driving it, and are we driving it in the right place? So interesting good time so I'm excited to hear from everybody still all your good ideas yeah <laughs> that was my plan actually so. <laughs> yes. we're all on the same page that good <laughs> we hope we have a lot of good ideas tonight <clears throat> um, with that I think we'll get started um, Liz I'd like to start with you um, you mentioned to me that you started blogging when you were diagnosed mm -hmm. um, and since then, your blog has grown to 12,000 visitors a year. And unique well, visitors. Unique visitors. That's not page views. Awesome. No. <laughs> and, and many of them come back over and over. Um, so I wanted to know, do you think it's the personal story behind your blog that, that helps it succeed? Well, yeah. A blog is successful if there's a good personal story. Um, I think when somebody is diagnosed with something, anything, but especially something crazy like brain cancer, it sounds like a death sentence, definitely. Um, when you're diagnosed with something, anyone here a patient? Because I think we're all patients at some point. You go to the doctor for whatever. And you usually will go online and you'll look something up or you WebMD yourself and then you freak yourself out and eventually you're like, oh my God, I must have brain cancer. Um, my case, I actually do have brain cancer. But um, I think when somebody has something, they look it up and they find out whatever they can find out before they actually go in. And in some cases, that's cool. In some cases, that's bad. And in the case of a cancer, I think a lot of people are just trying to figure out, okay, what are my treatment options? Should I do what my doctor has said? And by the way, is anyone still alive? And what, what makes cancer blogs, because there's tons of them, I don't have the only cancer blog out there, but what makes them attractive to the patient is they like to hear from someone who's going through the same thing that they are going through. And I was diagnosed a week after my 29th birthday, and it was in 2008, and so I'm four years out from diagnosis. and. My blog chronicles the first year, and then you know, brain surgery number one, brain surgery number two, two, two years of chemotherapy, rehabilitation, learning how to walk again, and there's so many experiences that different brain cancer patients fall along that timeline, and you know, maybe they're, you know, a few, they just got diagnosed today, and they're looking it up, and they're freaking out, and they, they can relate to that experience, and read back my old post to figure out, you know, okay, how did Liz deal with this? Oh, okay. And she had a hard time too, and I'm having a hard time too, and so they, I guess, identify. Is that answering the question? Okay. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the panel if you 
Me. Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, Liz has some really important things to say. Number one, the story is compelling. So obviously people connect. And, and when I've met people who don't know me real, but actually virtual, and then meet them in person, goes, I feel like I know you. I don't know if you've ever run into mm -hmm. that. Because they know you through your story. So being authentic really matters, especially in healthcare. Um, number two is that if you look at the Pew Internet and American Life Project, and they're the group that's been watching healthcare. And you know, the Pew, I'm sure you guys know about the Pew you know, project they've been watching since 2000. All, you know, how social media, how's the internet really affect all of us? How we engage in education, politics, healthcare. And they said there's three things that people look at, you know, at least from health. They look at one diagnosis. So, as, you know, as Liz said, you know, I've got this diagnosis or symptom. That's the number one thing people look on the internet. Uh, number two, then, the next one is actually treatment. What are the treatment options? Or what, what, the, you know, what medicines do I take? And the third part is actually, you know, who are the doctors or healthcare providers? So those are the three big buckets. And so Liz already illustrated very quickly what those, um, you know, things are. Um, the other thing I'd point out is there's actually a big difference in cohorts. And I think she's alluding to a very thing that I'm worried about as a doctor is how do you take, uh, I think it's a, good, it's a good conversation. I think this really is the wild, wild west. I mean, um, and in, in a good way, okay, in a good way. Um, Information is available 24-7, 365. So now you don't have to worry about waiting for whatever. There's a downside. Now you can worry about everything yeah. that's on the internet because it's everywhere. It's, not, it's unfiltered. There's no journalistic um, ethic. There's, I mean, it's all over the place. That's, that's good and bad. Because in med school, we have the same phenomenon, right? In third year med school, I'm like, read, read, read. Oh my god, I got this. <laughs> then you find out, no, 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 this doesn't look like that. Because when you see a patient really with that, that's what it looks like. And next, next chapter, you go, oh my god, I got this. And, and we, we do this all year. And you know, all the doctors I know have trained. We've all been through this. And so the, 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 what people are seeing now is you're getting that real time 24-7. Because if in the middle of the night, you're trying, I don't know what to do, who's available? Dr. Google, 24-7, 365. Yeah. You're embarrassed? Don't worry, because Dr. Google doesn't judge. <laughs> right? It doesn't judge. The problem is you can really scare the bejesus out of you. And sometimes it is right, sometimes it's wrong. Um, but what I was going to say about cohorts, it's interesting. When you look at the Pew uh, researchers, they say people uh, 65 and older, um, about 80, 90% will actually seek a doctor as you know, the, the, the kind of person to get the right information from. And, and maybe 75% will you know, tr trust friends and family. If you go to a cohort under 30 years old, it totally is much lower. Actually, doctors are maybe about 75 percent, and, and family members are 72 percent. So it really changes. And then, of course, when friends go, well, you know, I'm sure this happens to all of you, right? Like, well, what do you think? That's going. Well, I thought this. What do you think? Well, I thought this. And next thing you know, you've got a bunch of people getting all kinds of data. No one's really sure what the right answer is. And so that's why it's important, I think, for doctors um, as well as patients to kind of meet, you know, both real and also virtually to engage each other because there's a lot of content out there, and some of it's really scary to read. If I wasn't a doctor, I'd be totally freaked out, frankly, and that, that's what worries me. But I think, I think Liz and other people out there who are really passionate about what they do actually make, make a huge, huge difference now because now people don't feel alone. I think that's the thing I've noticed the most. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, with, with people being able to go anywhere and get uh, information, I think privacy is, is a big issue that we can all relate to in that space. So. Um, with HIPAA and other healthcare laws, and even with personal ethics, what what balance is there between um, personalizing healthcare to be as helpful as possible and uh, respecting patient or uh, personal privacy? And I guess I'll just open that up to everyone. I can take a portion there. So with. Facebook, you all know you can just send a message to anyone. You can even send a message to a page. So you could go to the Coman Sacramento uh, Facebook page and you could send a message straight to us. And that, you don't know who's reading that, which is really interesting on Facebook. Um, another example is uh, we work with another healthcare provider and a patient will send in their info and they'll start describing their illness and, and everything that's going on. And, and we have our team who's, who's handling all that and we have to tell them, hey look, this is the general inbox. Let's point you to an actual doctor who can help you with that <coughs> and uh, have that confidentiality in that enclosed situation. Because everything is so open these days. It's all on there, even people on Facebook. They, they tell the whole world and their friends what's going on with their bodily functions almost okay. daily. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely an issue and um, you know, there's ways you can, you can kind of stave off some of that by having your social media disclaimers, um, things like that, kind of guiding people. You know, here's all the information we offer. 
um, and use it in the right way to where it's going to benefit you and you're not going to be embarrassed because um, we don't we don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so I think we've had similar not as much with HIPAA regarding but where because our teams are all family and they're so close and they really do interact a lot on Facebook it's like hey everybody send me your email for whatever's going on and then all of a sudden you have everyone's email home address and phone numbers in comments oh, I'm yeah. trying to explain to them like you might want to private message this or there's a better way because even though we didn't put it up and we didn't start it it's on our page so how, who's responsible for it at that point when that information potentially gets misused? And how do we, as the responsible party, kind of mitigate that by either taking down comments or, you know, but you don't want to infringe on the social media interaction that's happening and the good stuff that's coming out of it. But it's almost like training our people. There are a lot of more older or less tech savvy saying, here's why you don't want to do this because there might be 15 people on your direct team but there's 385 on the team and training page that you're posting your hey i had this today here's my home address come on over <laughs> and um just trying to help people understand that it really can be misused and and where the responsibility comes in on our end of things interesting there was an interesting story i alluded to in my book about this guy at, um, who actually was coming home in oregon and you may have seen this story. It's sort of shocking. And a bunch of people are taking stuff out of his house. He goes, what's going on? He goes, someone posted on Craigslist, like, you're having a fire sale or something. He goes, but I live here. And he goes, yeah, well, it doesn't matter because here's the printout. Um, and so that's why I think I'm fearful and also excited that we have information 24-7 because it is, as you say, that like people just post up. They don't realize that there's yeah. an audience out there. And some will be like really great, like, oh, I really needed your phone number, great, I can get it. And the other group's like, we don't really know what people are gonna do out there. Or people get really wrong information about, oh my God, this is blah, 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 therefore I'm gonna start doing this, this, this. And some people may have really bad decision making when it could have been better. So I think that's kind of the challenge and also the opportunity to say, you know, we can do better versus in the past, it seemed like very paternalistic. Now we have information, but as you point out, the more information, the more free it is, then it all comes, where are the boundaries now to really protect privacy, really be personalized and really get to that. And I think that's the challenge going forward. Uh, you mentioned personalized there. Um, <clears throat> with uh, different organizational structures, we have smaller organizations that focus on maybe leukemia and lymphoma or just cancer. But then we have larger organizations that uh, focus on everything, like Kaiser, for instance, focuses on all aspects of health. Um, what are the pros and cons from a consumer perspective um, of those different structures, do you think consumers prefer using uh, or seeking out the information from a smaller or larger organization, or does it balance out? Can I open that up to everyone to comment on? Are you asking how would we rather get information from a uh, larger yeah, organization or something sp specific? Mm -hmm. How would consumers prefer to? Well, as a consumer, um, <laughs> I would say, um, wow. When, when, you're, when you're a new patient, you, you don't care where the information, you're not thinking about where the information comes from, you're just like, what, where can I get, you know, you start going to Wikipedia pages, which might not okay. best necessarily be the best source. Um, but as, where I'm at now, I'm a, I'm a big fan of going to the, you know, I have a specific type of cancer. I like to go to the National Brain Tumor Society's website and the American Brain Tumor Association and blah, 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 um, to find out what's going on with research. And that, that's where I'm at as a patient. Um, but but go finding you know you know when you're diagnosed knowing because I'm a Kaiser patient I, I working with Kaiser to find out you know how how are they going to treat me and I guess you know you, you gravitate towards who is helping you and taking care of you at that point in time and then from there as you move along in the process you start kind of broadening your your circle of who you trust and where else you're going to go for more information so I, I wouldn't say it would be anything one thing in particular but your preferences change over time. Okay. Um, I was just gonna say it, it probably depends on every person as well, like in their personality. Some people are the type where, you know, you just run to the doctor, you do your thing, you go right back, you don't tell anyone. Or you have the type of person who is posting on Facebook, yeah, I'm going to the doctor, <laughs> and they're telling everybody. Um, and so I, I think people are gathering this information from all different sources. They might so, you know, someone who has brain cancer, they might be leaning on, leaning on you for, you know, 
mental support, kind of inspired by someone who's gone through something, but you're not going to be the one who sees them at, you know, the doctor and healing them and be another no. doctor. <laughs> so yeah, so you would, they would get their information from Kaiser, they'd get it from their actual doctor, they'd, they'd get emotional support from Liz, and that's kind of how it happens within Komen as well, because we don't have just the technicalities of diagnosing something, but there's also the whole side of receiving that emotional support that you need day to day, which is why we have these communities and groups. Which, you know, we've met here because we all have a certain need, we want to hear about something. Um, so that's kind of important. You, you deal yeah. with that as well. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, I think personally, um, I like to look at it from like the mortgage blow up standpoint of everybody when the market crashed and everything happened, everybody read every article coming from anywhere mm -hmm. and then would listen and follow the directions of their friend who'd been through it. And that's it. And um, I think we're so much more in tune with that idea because it's comfortable because there's someone else there saying, I've done this whether or not that person's leading you blindly into the vast nowhere. But um, I, like for example, I answer the phone occasionally, if so no one wants to answer the phone. And I talk to a lady who, hey, we're having, we just got this diagnosis. And I'm telling you like, I am not a doctor. <laughs> I will refer you a thousand ways, whatever you need to do. And that person still calls back. And it's really funny to, I mean, it's not funny, it's great because obviously she feels connected to us and the information we provided, but it's, a little scary. I got an email from one of the ladies the other day. Said, I'm feeling this way. I've had this treatment. I really just don't feel good. I can't get off the couch. What do I do? And I'm sitting at my desk in Sacramento and she's in Santa Clara and I'm going, uh, I call your doctor. I don't know. And was able to connect her with our patient services, patient and person down there, her doctor looped in. And then I called her friend who had been connected in our team and training and said, Hey, your friend just emailed, this is what's going on. I don't know how much I can tell you, but I can't help because I'm two hours away and I am literally not a doctor. But it's interesting because I was the person who was responsive, who answered the phone, who listened. You become like a semi-expert, and which is the double-edged sword we've been talking about. Of It's really great because you're connected and you have that opportunity to connect that person with the organization and get them the services. But at the same time, please don't refer to me for advice on what to do with chemo treatment. I can't help you. I've, been, I've never been there and it, like I said, I'm not a doctor. So it's, it's that interesting dichotomy of how to, mm. how to manage that information. And I think just to, from the doctor's point of view, why did that happen, right? Think about it. I mean, because she's in the, she and, and he, their, their organizations, they represent are incredibly accessible. I mean, how many of your doctors have a Facebook page that you can actually say, hey, I'm having a bad day? How many doctors can you email? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm being serious. No, I'm being serious now because as you see things unfold, you're saying like, you know, he's asking like, what, what do we think? You know, I know Mayo Clinic's way out there, but we're not really sure. I know, you know, uh, Kaiser's working on stuff, but I'm not sure where we are yet. So that's why I'm not representing Kaiser. So I'm really doing my own thing well before the organization. But people have a need that needs to be met, right? And right now, say I'm having symptoms. Who do I call? I call the, you know, I call the Facebook page of the Leukemia Society. I call the Facebook page of Coleman. And they're going... We're not there, but what if the healthcare organizations were there and still could support them? Because really, they're, but the patients don't know. They're saying, we don't know who to go to, and you're the most easily accessible. And I think that's the reason why to, my pronged approach really is not only patient empowerment and engaging with them and giving them the tools they need, but also making sure on our end, you know, doctors, we've got to be able to lead this too. We've got to be there. We have to meet patients where they want us to meet, which is 24-7, 365 on the internet, and give them information they need it, and it's trustworthy because, as you said earlier, What's the content? It's all over the place when you're not sure. You'll just grab what's the most popular or what's the most relevant, you think, or what resonates with you, which may not be actually the right information at all. And so I think that's really the challenge going forward, and it's still really murky. It's getting more clear than it was maybe five or six years ago, but I think there's a lot of growth and opportunity for everyone to, to really seize hold of this new world, really. Mm -hmm. Don't you see that healthcare providers, the biggest concern lies in what you're talking about? I work at UC Davis Health System. Great. Is, um, the, the fear of, the, of the making a diagnosis or making a call via a social media platform that the, the liability that gets involved in it. Well, I, yeah, I mean, uh, for a couple of things. Number one is I would never try to make a diagnosis via no, social media. Via Facebook. But, um, uh, but, 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 but let's be clear, right? Um, and I teach my first year med students from UC Davis this when they come by. 90% of nailing the right diagnosis is listening. What is your story to me? 
And we know research shows doctors interrupt your patients 23 seconds before, before you, like 23 seconds and boom, I'm, I'm very interrupted. Um, and so my <laughs> students know that the most important thing, despite all the fancy smancy MRI, CT scans, all the tools I have, it's the most important to talk and listen. And so I can get a pretty good sense of that. And so at Kaiser, we do emails. We, patients email us all the time. And I can pretty much tell. And then sometimes I need to do a next step, which is maybe a phone call, because I need to hear your voice. I need to hear some things. And if I can't tell them, then I need to see you, and I need to actually feel you, because I need to examine you and figure out, because sometimes I just need more information. So actually, I think the fear is that, they said this um, 100 years ago, about how the telephone is going to be the death of doctors, because they will destroy all house calls. You know, you take a phone. Oh my god. Um, and so I think, I think what happens is the generation of doctors coming right now, the millennials, are going in. They've grown up with computers. I mean, a lot of you might be millennials right now. Yeah, my daughter is eight. Um, she doesn't know the world before iPads and iPhones. She just thinks everything is swipeable. My five-year-old like <laughs> try to swipe my laptop, but <laughs> guess what? You can't swipe the screen, right? Um, so I think those concerns that we have will be overcome. But the question you ask is the right one: is Are we that thoughtful? Because the group that I posted on their blogs are the same group that will do the same thing in doctors. And in fact, they've had doctors fired because they were blogging or tweeting about stuff. And it didn't take long to figure out who they were tweeting about. And so there's that tension. But I'm very confident the world will see, if, if done right, it's going to be much more personalized because it's informational, real time. It's your doctor getting the right diagnosis and treating you as a, as a patient, knowing I know who you are because of all the data I have. Um, but how do you do that with privacy? How do you get that um, teamwork? Um, that, that's still a work in progress. But I'm really optimistic. Good question. That, that was actually my next question is what? <laughs> What do consumers want um, from organizations? Uh, it sounds like 365, 24-7. Um, do you think that um, that will, what can we do to get there? Um, how can we provide consumers um, things in the meantime to kind of bridge that gap between now and you know that already present, um, give me, give me, give me? I, as a consumer, I would say I've been thinking about this lately, the resurgence of the concierge doctor type of idea and structure. And I think it is because we're so accustomed to like, I want, I want to know now. I want a Facebook. I, you know, you didn't answer my email. It was 20 hours. I, are you dead? What happened? You know, and that idea of you want someone at your beck and call because you want your real life to interact in the same way that your social media, your online presence interacts. And it'll be interesting to see how that is met because obviously if you have you know a giant group of patients you cannot physically be there 24 7 for all of those people but i think that's where that demand is leading so however that's met that's your your job sorry <laughs> it's a big task <laughs> um actually i'm not as concerned about that i'm more concerned about the point from the uc davis person about how doctors are going to do that because i think doctors are very much um one of the obstacles. I think regulations were obstacles. A lot of reasons. Um, but I think it's because we never grew up with that and we turn to learn from our professors and the professors, they're not tweeting. They're not going to teach us how to tweet. So it's going to be really a bottoms up approach. Uh, going to the concierge part, I think what people really want is to be heard and be personalized. They want to be known, like I know who you are. And you're not just some person I've seen maybe once in a, you know, a year. And, and the thing I like about working at our organization, we have the most advanced IT system in the world at Kaiser. We have the world's most advanced civilian electronic medical record. So when patients walk in the door, I know everything about them. It's totally firewalled, never goes down, it's 24-7. And that's the personalized care state. I know, hey, we talked last month and we talked about this. And they can get their labs online. So I think the real challenge is going to be how do we dissect it out to like, you just need information. Like Liz does a great job. If you go to her website, it's fantastic. I mean, you're, you're right there with her. Emotional support. I can't do that. I'm not there, but she is. How do I get that information where I don't necessarily need a live body, but I want to feel like I know her and I, I can get through this too. She did it, I can get through this. How <coughs> much is the information 24 7 365 is that I need to see somebody because someone needs to put a needle in my shoulder because it really hurts, I need a cortisone shot. How do we balance, balance all those? Because people really don't want to come in and see me for a cold. They want to know, is it a cold or pneumonia? Because it's a pneumonia, I want to see you. Or if you can be <laughs> traded safely over the phone or email, send me an antibiotic, you know? But if you need to see me, yeah, I need to see you. I'm going to come in. But this is where the healthcare system right now is kind of like, well, it's a good schmuck. I don't know what I have. I think it's a little cold. I'm not really sure. Please come in. 
but it's just a cold or a sprained ankle. Is it really bad? Do we need to go to the emergency room? Can you safely wait till next week? You know, I've got this trip coming up. I really don't want to miss Europe. You know? <laughs> and so you go to WebMD, right? Like, well, that wasn't really helpful. And then you ask your friend, what was that? Well, I kind of just taped it and, you know, you know, bandaged it and this, that, and the other thing. Oh, okay. Um, and so that's, and that's where people are using YouTube now, right? There's all this stuff like, what are you trying? So, are you serious? So true. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> Doctor yeah. YouTube? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, you know, people, um, for doctors, like you're trained, there's a thing called the epi maneuver, how you yeah. move a person's head to help them from benign positional vertigo. And the National Academy of uh, Neurology actually did a research study, uh, just a little paper on it. And so it's very effective, and patients could do it. And so there's, there's this magical um, uh, a veil that's being lifted off, right? It's like there's nothing magical. The challenge is going to be is making sure that that vertigo is benign and not something serious where you need medical care. And that's where there's a gap of knowledge. And that's where the third-year med students get, you know, worried every day that they're ill of some bad disease, and, and then they get experience and go, okay, it's not that. And how do you meet that? And that's the challenge. But I actually am very optimistic if the doctors lead the change with patients also engaging together, not adversarial, but collaboratively moving forward for the for both parties. And they're both going to have a little tension because they're different points of view. But again, if we all think about it's about the patient, it's not about the doctors. It's about all this getting better. I, I, I think um, I think we'll we'll be fine, but uh, it's going to be a very interesting next five five years. I think. Do you think um, I know that um, I forget what the society is, but um, the brain National Brain Tumor National Society? Brain Tumor Society has reached out to you mm -hmm. uh, because of your success on the blog. Do you think, or do you think that um, organizations will continue to do that? Reach out to successful individual bloggers, or um, you know, Facebook or Twitter influencers um, to bridge that connection between doctors who you know can provide that medical side but maybe don't have that personal connection I think well the National Brain Tumor Society reached out to me I mean I started going to some of their walks every organization does like a walk and awareness type thing slash mm -hmm. fundraiser um, but with with what with brain cancer being one percent of all cancers there aren't that many people out there especially people who are still alive to actually go out and be advocates and to be a voice of, of a disease and for them um, they, they were having a real hard time finding people who would actually be the face I guess of, a, of their disease and well and you know I know Leukemia Lymphoma Society and Susan G. Komen um, there's probably a lot more people who can be advocates and for them they kind of they found me, they realized lots of people were reading my blog, they were reading my blog, they were sending their volunteers to read my blog, they're like, hey, here's somebody who's, who's talking about the brain cancer experience. And, um, and of course, I, w I was excited to jump in. And um, I, I, don't, I think, I'm not providing support on the sense of, here's how you should do it, because I'm a doctor, and, I, and people will, like you guys were saying, um, pour out their hearts to me in the comments field of the blog and say, oh, I had that same thing happen to me, or how do you deal with taking this form of chemotherapy, and did you find that eating X, Y, and Z upset your stomach too? And I always say, I'm not a doctor, but I can tell you from my experience what happened to me, but I, by no means is this you know, medical, medical information. Talk to your doctor first. Um, is that I, I think, and you had a question too, for, for, for well, or comment. My question's on a little bit different topic, but talking about doctors changing the way that people get information, I'm wondering for all of you who are communicating with folks every day on social media, as we move forward to 2014 and more people are going to have health insurance and more people are going to be somewhat unsophisticated about how to get their coverage and what to do. How do we use social media between now and then to begin to help educate folks about the choices or opportunities that they may have? And then once they have some coverage, how do we use social media to begin to direct them to get the kind of care they need, no matter what kind of care it is? Oh, well, I'd like to hold yep, great. that okay. question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure we yeah. No, 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 I asked well, No, 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 absolutely. Yep. Yep. Definitely want to bring in the audience, um, but. Uh, uh, I, I think I think organizations aren't sure, um, okay. because it's so new, right? We don't know if we should have um, uh, um, individual stories, and we all resonate with stories, right? Once a story, we resonate better than anything. One, <laughs> one story um, of one person. And so I think organizations finding doctors who can do that, patients who can do that, collaborating to do that, um, so we'll see. Um, but I, I don't think you're going to have just big organizations like the Mayo Clinic or Kaiser Says. I think it's always going to be more personal, like so-and-so from this organization says these things. Okay. What do you think? 
I don't. When I when I look at the schedules of different doctors and things, I don't ever. I honestly don't see doctors sitting and spending a few hours of their day on Facebook. I don't think that could be feasible because your time is better spent actually right. diagnosing people in the physical sense. But where a lot of this disconnect comes is the upper level organizations not being you know, on par with current social media. And the medical industry is actually one of, it's one of the slower moving areas of social media. Um, like for example, you have a lot of bloggers who go out with car rental companies and, and they're paid bloggers to go across the country and blog about their experience with this car and everyone loves it. So there should be 10 Liz's hired for each of these medical, <laughs> exactly. and for all of you that are interested in social media or already work in social media, I think where we're really going to see a lot quicker pace is when the upper level organizations are really on board. You know, maybe it's uh, a medical community that says we're going to have 10 bloggers and pay them to, you know, share their personal ex stories and their experiences. Um, that's that's where you'll see that that growing, bridging that gap. Yeah. Let me just add one comment. How many of you guys um, have a doctor who uses a paper and, and, um, and pen when they chart? Anyone still have doctors who actually use paper and pens? No, it's good. So California is really mm -hmm. one of the outliers. Cause I bet you in the across this country, there are probably a lot of doctors still use paper uh, mm -hmm. and Pens. And the reason I bring that up is, you're talking about social media doctors are way behind. Yes, and the rest of the country is way behind on using technology. I mean, you know, they do paper and pens and handwritten prescriptions and stuff. So it, it is it is a true uh, point he makes that healthcare is way behind, and that's where it's exciting because I mean, no, there's no rules yet. It's really not yet defined. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit to uh, talk about social platforms where people. Are engaging the most for healthcare. Uh, we all know about Facebook and Twitter, of course, but are there other places that are really kind of setting the pace for uh, healthcare activity? Um, I can speak to that. We use YouTube, our YouTube channel, to do uh, research tidbits and try to get the same information out to everybody versus, oh, I heard this thing that LLS is doing. Um, and engaging our doctors who we're funding in the different research grants to explain it on the personal level but on the YouTube channel so you can have like a five minute nugget to say this is what I learned um, and then we can use those too to promote through Facebook and even through email because the reality is not everybody is super hip to social media so promoting that so that people get the message get what's going on with their money and the patient service different options that they have um, just to have that coming from a doctor it feels personal and it i think the good thing about doing it that way is when you no one wants to sit and read research notes it's too mumbo jumbo -y. it gets really dry really fast but if you have the doctor who that is their story their story is finding a cure for your illness and they're looking at you via the computer but saying this is what i'm doing this is why i'm doing it this is the impact it's having we obviously can't have all those doctors come meet our people but we can send them that and say look these are the people that care about what you're doing, and typically those doctors are available to our people to talk to and, and to kind of get that FaceTime with, but it does give the option of doing FaceTime online. That's great. There's, there's a great resource. It's called Planet Cancer. Um, there's a really specific cancer community. It's called the Young Adult Cancer Community between the ages of 18 and 40. I'm in that category. And what's sad about that category is the survival rates for young adult cancer patients have not, any type of cancer haven't improved in the past 30 years. And plus, when you're when you're diagnosed in that age group, you're kind of in this transitional period of life. You might still be in college, you're still trying to find maybe your first job, or you're kind of in the middle of your career, but then you get diagnosed with something. Maybe you haven't gotten married yet, maybe you're trying to figure out if you can have kids. And so this huge support group has um, grown around that group, and um, there's an organization called Stupid Cancer specifically focuses on the young adult cancer community. And there's this platform um, through Planet Cancer that's kind of set up like Facebook, specifically for young adults with cancer. So you actually create your username, if you're a pastor, you have your little profile, and you're like, my name's Liz, I'm 33, and I have brain cancer. And then what's cool is other people can find you based on cancer types. And, and then you can kind of share and meet friend, make friends and um, you know, that's something probably most of you wouldn't even know existed, but if you're in that world, you totally need it. But think how revolutionary what she just said, okay? Mm -hmm. She said 1% of cancers are brain cancer, if I heard you correctly. Yep. 
And number two, she said, in a moment, she can connect with other people and say young adults with cancer and 1%. Now, if you went back 10 years, not that long ago, right? And you had brain cancer, how many people do you think you would know personally that would have brain cancer? How would you network? Would you have to call friends of friends of friends? I mean, she's talking about relatively random strangers, I suspect, who yeah. just connect, right? That's how powerful is that now versus 10 years ago? How alone do you feel versus how empowered do you feel now? Totally changed the game. Um, the only thing I'd say is um, just, uh, yeah, um, besides moms, women are the chief health officer at all homes, in case you know that. <laughs> and where are they all? They're on Facebook, right, in that home. Mm -hmm. um, not because they're on Facebook because they have nothing to do, but because they're trying to figure out how to take care of kids and things like that, because it's really stressful. The most stressful job in life is actually being a parent, if those you don't know that. Um, but for doctors, the two websites you may want to check out if you're curious is KevinMD.com. That's mm -hmm. like a lot of people where they go to <coughs> their policy and the healthcare blog. And so um, what's nice about those is they'll actually take submissions, so you'll see my things up there. And what it becomes is from just me, my own blog, now they've got an aggregate of lots of readers, and you get tons of content, you get all kinds of really good feedback. And so that's how you really learn quickly, you know, where you, what you believe in, what the issues are. And so that if you're interested about you know, healthcare policy, it'll be a two I look at. Follow them on Twitter. I'll follow them on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk hashtags for a minute, because they are my favorite thing. Um, I think healthcare provides a little bit of a unique op opportunity to kind of mobilize um, patients through hashtag. Um, so what are um, some ways that consumers uh, in the healthcare community are using hashtags? And I know that... Um, I have a good story about healthcare okay. hashtags. Okay, so I'm a brain cancer blogger, tweeter. And I follow other people with various types of cancers and health professionals. And one night, it was a Monday night, Monday evening around six o'clock, I suddenly saw all these people I know in the cancer community tweeting with a hashtag BCSM. And I was like, what, what, what is this? And they were talking about somebody in the breast cancer community who had died. I was like, oh man, I was like, what is this BCSM? And then there's this website, Tweet Chat, where you can use Twitter as more of like a chat room type thing. And it's following based off of a hashtag. So I put in BCSM and I'm seeing all the tweets come in using that hashtag. <coughs> and I, I just asked, I was like, hey, hey what's, what's BCSM? And they're like, oh, it stands for Breast Cancer Social Media. So if you're you know, tweeting about breast cancer, you can engage with our community by just using BCSM. I was like, oh. That is really cool, man. I wish there was something like that for brain cancer. Too bad you already have BCSM. And they're like, what about BTSM, brain tumor social media? I was like, all right, let's start it tonight. And and so I just tweeted everybody I knew within the brain tumor community or cancer community in general. I said, hey, start using this thing, BTSM. You know, whenever we're talking about brain tumors or brain cancer, use it. And it you know, started six months ago, it's caught on. And then I've since then learned there's HCSM, which for, stands for Healthcare and Social Media. The Healthcare and Social Media group meets every Sunday night, 6 p.m. Pacific. The Breast Cancer Community meets every Monday night, 6, uh, 6 Pacific time. And Brain Tumor Social Media doesn't meet at a certain time, but in the there's like a website that's track, tracking all the healthcare specific hashtags. And I gotta say, one of the top 10 hashtags for healthcare is BTSM right now. So if you're gonna that's tweet awesome. about brain tumors and stuff, use it. So. <laughs> Any other? Um, you know, I, the hashtags are great because you can kind of see a conglomerate of what the world's thinking. You know, um, that's why Facebook has taken off so fast and, and the, the way it has taken off so fast is you can target ads to a specific demographic. I mean, you might spend a few thousand dollars for a billboard on the road and maybe the people that drive by will like what you have to offer, but Facebook can charge you a lot for advertising when you can click on there that to only show this ad to people who have liked a brain cancer page or they have an interest in those certain health type things. Um, so really what health organizations are doing and starting to do is collecting all this data and, and you can really start to see how many people are, are going to have some of these diseases in certain areas or you can see what people are talking about on Twitter and you can see how many people haven't gone to the doctor for a certain diagnosis and it's really interesting to see um, how we can use that for future planning. You know, uh, how, how many doctors do we need in a certain area of an underdeveloped country or, and, and this type of thing because we can kind of see these relations and what people are talking about because 
we our brains are all online now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> what I'd like to see is the advocacy organizations, whether it's Komen or Leukemia Lymphoma Society, to to know that these hashtags exist because mm -hmm. people are using them. And I don't know if you know those exist, but I know I work a lot with the National Brain Tumor Society, and I said, hey guys, did, did you know these hashtags exist for people with brain cancers and brain tumors? And you can easily get your message out to those who aren't already following you because if you use these hashtags. And they just, they're, they're as far as compared to other cancer advocacy organizations, not as savvy and as big yet, but um, but if they knew that these things existed, then they, they can reach their, grow their audience. And so they're starting to do that and go, oh, thanks, Liz, for giving a heads up. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, I guess I think I'm going to open it up to the audience to make sure we have <clears throat> enough time. So. Do I address the first one? Uh, yeah, I guess. Can you re-ask your question? I think it was about the, ex the healthcare reform hitting in 2014, exchanges opening, people are mandated by health insurance. The question is how do you engage people and get them to make decisions, smart decisions now going forward? Right, phrasing. exactly. How do we use social media to help educate a public and a population that's relatively new to this and maybe unsophisticated <coughs> about the whole process of getting insurance, using insurance, and, and relatively new to social media. I mean, how do we reach them with this tool? Well, you have Facebook. Facebook has done a lot of growth in that area where you can kind of see if any of you have created a page for something, you can choose what type of organization it is, whether it's like a retail store or a band. And your pages are kind of tailored to, um, you know, the type of information you're going to want to see uh, for a band or, or what you're going to see for um, a famous person. They'll, they'll tailor the type of data you can put in those fields. So I think everything will kind of merge as one. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a difficult question because you don't know how far Facebook's going to come in aiding these organizations. And you don't know how far government's going to come or these, these standalone um, health clinics. But hopefully we can meet together in, in, a, in a way that's beneficial to the consumer. Um, I don't know. Just well, I think you hit on something really important, though, when you say not only these people are new to navigating health care, but they're new to navigating social media. And it's that weird jam of the people who are hip to it are already going to know. They're going to seek it out. They're going to problem solve it. So how do you take the people who might be just random Facebookers and they're, you know, the 19-year-old girl with the, the iPhone who doesn't actually know how to load a picture, but will take them, and, you know, and is not actually even very literate in social media and get that person to understand, go here, here's what you do with it. Like Dave and I talked earlier about teaching people to click share instead of like mm. is like huge huge project <laughs> and and just getting that conversation started because it is really hard it's like what we looked at in what the mid 90s where was, i'm gonna send you an email <laughs> don't call me back i want you to email me and how many people here still teach your parents like here's how you attach a photo on email <laughs> so we're having this conversation how do you use social media when you're dragging a a big chunk of the public with you and how do you balance that because you really do have to access people on every single level um so i didn't answer it i just told you i have a bigger problem and, Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> there, there's there's different tools that we all have to learn how to use i mean we always go back to facebook because nowadays kids use that when they're little and they know how to use it brilliantly when they get older and it would be really cool if maybe you had maybe Kaiser had its page and there were sub pages and you could message your doctor on its sub page, but they'd all be connected somehow on Facebook. And those would be cool things <laughs> because because we already know how to use it. But Kaiser has great tools as well. They have their whole online infrastructure, which helps you know patients email their doctors, and that's the other disconnect as well. You know teaching people how to use those systems because most people aren't willing or they're a little scared or trepid in, in what they're doing. Um, so well, know. and they don't have the attention span uh, yeah, either, exactly. too. Like, you're talking about, I'm going to teach you how to use insurance, and you're potentially giving insurance to someone who doesn't have a bank account, and they're going to maybe read an infographic, but really they want a picture and it has to have a cat, and then if the cat teaches insurance, we're good. But <laughs> if the cat doesn't, it really is... It is, it, I mean, it is a really interesting question. I like it. 
and I, uh, uh, I'm going to make a comment to that. And I think, really, um, social media for those people who are savvy in social media, social media will provide um, a tool for allowing organizations to leverage those crowds to uh, make changes and facilitate and put public pressure on uh, the government organizations to make changes to what they want. So I think it will be an asset, but then to your point, those organizations um, are going to have a challenge reaching the groups who maybe might need it most. That can, you can develop a new platform. There you go. <laughs> um, I, I was going to ask about, uh, there's something called the e-patient movement, which I got connected with a couple of years because I manage a program that has to do with med tech. Uh, and I participated in the healthcare social media chats for about a year. And it's a really interesting group there. A lot of it was more on sort of the HIPAA side, uh, less from the patient side and more from the provider side. Um, but I just wondered if any uh, e-patient could stand for empowered, engaged, enabled. Um, and there's a couple big names in that. I don't know if you guys knew. Um, at Schwinn or at e patient Dave are two of the people that, that I follow. But I just wondered if, uh, I haven't heard that term used here, and I wondered if anyone wanted to, to speak about it. If, if you're involved in that, I know they have conferences. Um, it's all about patients, just like what you're talking about, patients coming together, connecting with each other. Uh, you hear things about, I forget what the disease was, but some woman posted a picture of her child who doctors were having trouble diagnosing what was wrong with her, or wrong with the child, and just by posting it on Facebook and getting wider people looking at it, this rare disease was, um, I, I don't want to say diagnosed, but suggested a, as being the issue. And um, I'm just curious, how, how would you advise us to, to, to get more connected, maybe someone who has a family member who is ill or you are um, sick, yourself, um, you know, what are some of the steps you want to take to go get get connected with people who can um, share your story? I'd never heard that term until you brought it up with, in an email with me. I was like, yeah, the Eve patient. I don't know what that stands for, but it sounds like me because I'm electronically connected. Um, advice or steps for people who you yourself are a patient or a family member is you search online um, you obviously and you there's tons of uh, resources out there as far as like Facebook pages that currently exist or you might find another blogger and read what they have to say and you know in my case I'll also list other bloggers that I found other brain cancer bloggers and then um, you just start following those people and connecting with them. Um, and then you were talking about, you were actually sitting in on following along the healthcare and social media, hashtag HCSM um, conversations, which tend to be more of the healthcare professionals. But now the layman patient who's learning a lot about healthcare is starting to chime in on those as well. And I had also found, um, I'm, I don't have breast cancer, but I had connected with the breast cancer social media people. And that's a really, um, that was like a grassroots thing started yeah. by a couple of uh, women doctors and it's moderated by doctors mm -hmm. uh, and it's a moderated discussion that they have on Monday nights so um, USA I, I, Today just did an article about hashtag BCSM oh, and that they? exists mm -hmm. yeah and that it has inspired other uh, patient communities different interests to start their own thing so you actually brought out two different ideas um, the e-patient you guys ever heard about the e-patient movement at all some of you have so one of the big people is E. Dave, and he actually had stage four, I believe, renal cell cancer. And it's a, you know, when you have stage four of anything, it's not a good thing. And his prognosis is very poor, um, but he kind of beat it. And, and so there, there's the tension, because, you know, from a doctor's point of view, you know, we have our expertise. But we're not, you know, no one's going to be as invested as the individual patient, right? And he, E. Dave is very much, you know, did lots of research, probably far more than any one of us would be because I mean he's one of those outliers way out there so I think there's a spectrum because right. there's the e-patient was like it's kind of like the um, do-it-yourselfers in financial services right for retirement I want to invest everything I will do it myself right and there's some people there and it's fine I think that's where technology really helps but people's like no nah, just let me just put it in here and let you professionals deal with it so there's a spectrum and so you've got to figure out where you are on the spectrum um, so that that's one part and I think it's 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 a valuable um, thing to push physicians and, and healthcare say you know we want these things the, the challenge is going to be, for example, the e patient, some of the e patients want like all the data from their pacemakers. They want every single heartbeat. They want to download it. 
<laughs> Here you go. Um, but the problem is we don't know how to interpret it. Because th that's the a, that's a tension, right? Because we have tons of data now. We have tons of data. But we're not even sure what that means. So uh, each patient might go, oh my god, I've got this rhythm. I bet these heartbeats. What does it mean? Doesn't mean anything dangerous from our point of view, but I want to know what it means. Mm. We're not there yet because we never had these pacemakers 20 years ago. You know, we don't, we can't measure every heartbeat. We don't know. So their their doctors are working on figuring out. There's a movement called measure every heartbeat that's actually happening right now, and, and so that's one part. The other part you said was interesting, which I, I think is where the exciting part is the crowdsourcing. So what happened was they put a diagnosis, and so you could trust your doctor, and of course there's going to be some trust because doctors know a lot of stuff. We don't know everything. That's what E Dave kind of pointed out. His doctor knew a lot of stuff, but not even not the. Because the, the, the E Dave's gonna spend 24 seven researching all the articles, right? And the doctor's got other patients over here, she's gonna give you the best that you can give, but maybe not as personalized. But the crowdsourcing stuff, I got this weird diagnosis my doctor hasn't figured out. What do you all think it is? And they do this in the New York Times right now. If you look at the, you know, you know be a doctor and think through the differential diagnosis. Maybe it's, in, it's on Lisa Sanders, MD, who actually is a technical advisor for House, actually. For, I think she's from Yale. Um, she only had every few, every week or two, so, you know, here's a case and you figure it out. And not everyone gets it right, obviously, right? Uh, but the whole point is that, how powerful is that? Now, a, a rare diagnosis gets picked off because someone outside of that doctor-patient relationship has seen that somewhere. You know, wait, I know that. You need to do this. And that's where it's really powerful. Um, so, of course, the downside is like, well, I think it's this, 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 and they see a 20 million money supporting quarterbacks saying it's all these things. They're like, okay, which one is it? And then, so, but that's what's really exciting now, is that we can get better diagnosis, better treatment, more quickly with crowdsourcing. We have people pushing the envelope, but realizing not everyone has to be an e-patient. They can actually be okay saying, you know what, I've got these doctors that are working together and patients working <coughs> together to give me the right treatment. I don't have to do all that research because, you know, someone else has done it for me. I can just follow their journey and, and learn from them. So I think that's what's really exciting. So I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, when the information security world thinks about social media, they start throwing up all kinds of blocks, roadblocks, etc. So my question, and so organizationally, there's a lot of pushback to accepting social media as part of your organization. My question is, have you encountered pushback from information security within an organization? And if so, how have you counteracted that? How have you helped, uh, what do you call it, calm their concerns? I think that's a good question for you. <laughs> they haven't called me yet. I guess I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they haven't called is not a problem. Well, no, I think the question you're asking is, um, I, I'm sorry, I, I want to make sure I understand your point of view. So right. are you a patient or you're someone in health care? No, okay. So security. In, <laughs> information security. Information security, maybe yeah. I should be. I don't know. I've got to be careful. I'm an information security person. Okay. Okay. Who actually believes in social media <laughs> and, and, what, and the good things it does. So don't hurt me. Um, <laughs> So, um, and, I, and I encounter a lot of my, my cohorts who are against it because of some perceived threats. Some of them are real, some of them are not. So, in a, in a healthcare organization where HIPAA is the rule of the day, do you get pushback from information security saying, we're not going to go and adopt any social media? Do you get that type of thing? And if so, how do you counter it? Can you clarify, uh, are you talking about um, actual security threats or like HIPAA related? So, so there's actually two parts to it. There are actual security threats and there are HIPAA concerns as well. Right? So I mean there's, without getting deep into it, there's a big difference between security right. and compliance. Right? So um, I mean if there's no concern, that's, that's great. But. I know we're working. I'm I work on our children's hospital page, and one of our concerns are things like allowing people to post pictures. Um, so you know we want families to be engaged. So they're in the children's hospital. I take a picture of you. You're my child. But there are five people. That, there are five other little kids in the background. Well, your mom might not like the fact that your kids' pictures on the page, or the fact that you know there's a there's. You know, there's a breakup in the family and the kids nobody else in the family I mean, those are issues that we have and mm -hmm. we're now questioning should we allow people what's the what's the level of privacy on whether we allow patients and people within other people in the community to post pictures on our page because 
we have issues with that. And I don't know what kinds of concerns, if, if that's something that you guys have come up against. Um, well, yeah, I'll yeah. tell you personally, you know, if I had known certain photos from college would be posted in Facebook 20 years later, <laughs> you know, I think we should have waivers, right? Let's be honest. So, right? Because, I mean, you think you laugh out now, but you don't know what technology is going to look like in 20 years. And actually, a hologram of you at a party 20 years yeah. ago, right? So, <laughs> let's be oh honest. So, so we, are, we are literally catching up as we go, right? Um, uh, no. We live in a world of always fear for the worst, and so therefore of course. we draw the yeah. line yeah. always on the side of caution, which from my perspective is <laughs> annoying, um, because I want those stories to be shared. I want people who have a child in our hospital and who had a good experience to share that. But at the same time, I realize there are concerns with that. And so well, we so run into that all the time. I was just going to mention, you know, sometimes you have to do a little bit of push-pull and everything, and and it does take a lot more time, but, you know, you can extract some of those stories and bring them to the forefront. Say, like, at Komen, often we'll take one woman's story, we'll gather pictures from her, and, you know, do some type of expose and, and share it. And that's kind of the controlled way you can handle it. You also have this difficulty of... Do you let the kids run with knives and scissors and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> um, so it, it becomes difficult, but, um, you know, I, I get for each organization, what we do when we come into an organization, we of, often have to do a lot of testing, um, you know, testing on the different types of posts. You have to look at the demographic of people and, and what they're going to be willing to share because it's also behavioral and... <laughs> It's difficult. You know, you might you might have someone who might post a p picture of themselves, or you know, ten people will do that, and then the eleventh person will put their health write ups online or something. You know, it's it's very it's a difficult issue there. Well, and I think um, the double edged sword of of coming from a business standpoint, you always want to be the most conservative to offend the least amount of people. But coming from social media, which is innately cutting edge and like you say we're building it as innately we go offensive. you know it's that weird how do you be punk rock and super classical all at the same time and i have to say i um worked on a project with a local big casino in town and came up with the same thing where someone said hey we want to do this thing and we want to show people having fun and it was the exact question of who's in the background that's not supposed to be there during the day who's in the background that's not there with their wife who you know and that exact thing is how does that, it's maybe someone that is completely not controlled by the organization posting on the page, but then the blowback comes back on you as the business or the corporation, and how do you mitigate that? And I think erring on the side of being conservative, but then again, how does it come into, we wanna be cutting edge, we wanna be on trend, balancing that, um, and just I, creating parameters, I think is the easiest way if you can set up some kind of way for there to be less children. I know for myself, my friends have, they know. Do not take a video of me if we're out dancing. Do not put it on the internet. <laughs> it will not be okay. You know, they, but I had to lay that out. So that kind of same parameter building. And um, I, uh, I, I'll make a comment on that. Um, from VSP's perspective, we um, have uh, had to grow our social media uh, acceptance from, I wasn't there at the time, but it was, there, but definitely a, a push and pull, um, and it, it is a more conservative organization in that um, health, uh, social media space. So yes, there was a lot of discussion of, well, should we let people post on the walls? Can we control this conversation? I don't like that someone's saying something negative on there, but we uh, just developed policies around it, and we do have HIPAA that we are required to follow. So. <clears throat> And we just follow it. You know, if, if people are posting um, something about their um, health health care, we'll delete it and then send them a private message if we can, or we'll comment to them and then delete it and say, you know, we deleted this because it's, uh, you know, for your privacy. Uh, and and then for pictures, we have guidelines that we share with employees to say, you know, we don't take pictures of children, or if there's children, we have to have a release. Um, you know, no pictures with alcohol. That sort of thing. So we have those same policies, but if, if you took this, it's, it's the privacy of whether or not we allow other people, people yeah. to post on our page. And, and we do allow those. Um, it's just uh, it's kind of a if it's inappropriate, we'll delete it. If not, it's just letting that. Yeah. Um, I'm a sutter, and 
And our pages, we have pages and we have groups. So a group is self-maintained and it's a user group. So for our autism crowd, they do post pictures and they own those pictures and it's separated from Stutter in one sense. On our pages, we don't allow people to post photos. Um, and if, to your question about, you know, electronic health record and HIPAA versus, you know, information and the security issues, they are two completely different things. And to your point, we've had people say, you know, I'm having a heart attack, somebody please help me. Well, we call 911, we figure out where they are, we, you know, take special steps. But if somebody, and to your point earlier, we get like naked, gross, disgusting things that people send and have no idea, like you just sent me a picture of your bloody ankle, that's disgusting. I'm a social media person, not a physician. You know, it's been deleted and we contact them appropriately, you know, privately. But there's a big difference between pages versus user groups. And to the other point, we do not take any pictures unless everybody in the photo signs off on a consent form under every circumstance. So we just had our NICU reunion on October 13th, and we had moms and dads and babies and triplets and quads and everybody, every single person had to sign a release for any pictures posted up on the album at every level. So that puts a lot of pressure on leadership because we have to go to all of these events to get those sign-offs and then develop policies that are appropriate. And those pages are separate from the pages that employees post to. They want to post, and then that's a whole other HR issue because we have opportunities for service recovery and correction of behavior. And then we also have, you know, sort of our moral compass. If we're acting as setter, we always have to abide by the setter rules. So I can't go out and blog and say I'm Joe Schmo cool dude and really be ha ha and setter and I'm raping and pillaging your information. If I'm out there, I'm setter and I identify myself as such. So we have very strict policies, and to your point, they have evolved very rapidly, I'd say, over the last 28, 30 months, just to be able to accommodate those components. And Facebook continually adds more tools. You know, on the user side, if you have your actual page that you communicate with friends and everything, um, I know on mine I have it set to where if someone tags me I have to approve it before mm -hmm. it goes to the actual page. And Facebook's always working on that. It would simplify your problem if yeah. all there was was a queue to see what you're going to post and what you're not but obviously with Facebook they have infrastructure issues with holding all those things in queues and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lauren, did you have a question? Um, it's kind of beyond the scope uh, of here but um, HIPAA is like what 20 years old or, or older 96, huh? and I hear quite a bit of discussion that um, when it was written it, it really doesn't consider the state of the world now, particularly with um, how social media is being used kind of in all avenues. And so you hear talk of uh, possibly HIPAA being revised or uh, to accommodate what's going on now. Is there actually, is that just on people's wish list or is that actually something happening on that? Does anyone know? I don't. I could Google it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can Don't. say that for the security part of HIPAA, because there's, there's several parts of HIPAA, for the security part of HIPAA, they are constantly trying to evolve. They're all working to So I would say for the privacy side, it would be as well. And just my other comment is a lot of healthcare getting into social media is, is patient driven, that they can't, they really can't say forget about it, it's too hard to comply, because if they don't, you know, if Kaiser doesn't, then maybe Sutter's going to, and then people are going to choose to go to Sutter because they want to be more engaged with their health care provider. So it's almost, there's almost a competitive need to find a way to use social media in your organizations, I think, because the patients are expecting to have that kind of access. And, you, and you, even if you don't give it to them, they will come to you and say, you know, like you're saying, here's my bloody ankle, deal with this. Right. <laughs> Sorry to laugh. <laughs> 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 no, you have no idea. I mean, yeah. you go to people and they see your badge, and they immediately, must be like a lawyer or a doctor, right? <laughs> they just immediately start show, taking off clothes, booking like wow. they're going to be doing something wrong. Don't show me your elbow or anything. Even more. Like, I, I don't have a blue badge. I'm a worker. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I um, it's frightening, and it kind of proves to your point that you were referring to that they're starving for interaction, and it's really more of what is the real issue here, because we get this all the time. We're having a series of ortho lectures. I have one tomorrow, and I got phone calls all day today for people RSVPing, and every single one of them, instead of leaving me name, rank, serial number, and an email and a phone number so I can register them online, which they could do themselves, but the age <laughs> range, to your point, is like 65 and older, because it's 
joint and hip replacement arthritis, that kind of thing, right? They all want to talk for hours and tell me their entire story and all I want is their email. So I can send them the confirmation and my whole day is listening to that. So what needs, no, I'm, I'm not really nice. So <laughs> why are they not getting in another environment that they're talking to somebody who's just registering people for a class and they're so starved to tell their story of what happens to them and what it hurts their hip? And it's frightening. Because there's a, the, to your point, there's a huge gap there. And social media can fill some of that, but it gets back to the doctor and kind of what their needs are and, and the point about concierge medicine. It, it's, it, it can be really dragged down a rat hole very quickly. Mm -hmm. They should have a group on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have to wrap up here quickly. Um, so if I could go down the line here and say, um, based on your learning experiences uh, with social media over the past few years, I guess we'll limit it to, um, what is your recommendation for this room um, on how to use social media in the healthcare uh, space effectively? And interpret that, I guess, any way you want. I'll start. Um, for the healthcare professionals in the room, um, I think it's important for you to tap into what the, the patient world is like because you can more um, effectively communicate with them. I don't, the, the people I run into or the, the patients I talk to via the blog or via Twitter and Facebook, they, um, it, it doesn't seem like that their doctors know what's going online in the social media realm for patients. So it might be interesting to pretend you're a patient for a day and, and see what you find and what communities you might find and plug into. And then um, um, for people who are uh, social media professionals and if you get diagnosed with something, see what, what communities you can connect into once you might have something in the future. Because we're all going to get a little something at some point. Um, I would say it, it depends on who you are, but in the, the medical world, the important thing that should happen and is happening is that doctors need to be humanized more. You're looking at a doctor here who's very humanized, you can connect, he's written books and things like that. Um, but not every doctor has, not every doctor has a Twitter. Um, so on, on that level, we're going to connect backwards to the patients. Patients really just need to grab the information that's available. Um, you have such a wide spectrum because a, a prescription can be given, but the prescription's going to do nothing if you don't make the choice to take it. Um, you have people that have diseases and go on and live their life, don't really take care of it, and so they're not going to be as healthy, they're not going to become better by using the tools that are available, but I think, I think it meets both ways with the doctors being more engaged in social media as well as the, the patients and people. I think um, just recognizing that we're in a training and be trained situation and you at the same time as you're trying to train your constituent base as to how to access the information and what they're reading into, you're also being trained by them. It's like what is it that they want and how can you meet that need and just really writing out that give and take of how to work best because ultimately like from our standpoint, you know, your name is on the bottom line of that page or that Twitter feed. And you want to help people use you as a tool, but you also want to be willing to take from them what, how they can resource you best. I, should, I wish I had words of wisdom. I, I would say, I don't know where each person is in this group. I'll see from different constituents. I just say, just do it. And the reason I started blogging is because my publicist says, me, you want to do this in 2007? I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then Twitter, I was like, I signed up for Twitter many years ago. I'm like, remember, okay, I signed up, now what? <laughs> had no followers. I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, that's interesting. Uh, anything else happen? So I'd say just do it because it really is a brand new world. <coughs> no one really knows. I think we have to be very cognizant of the information security people back there remind us that we have to be HIPAA compliant. We really have to be conservative because at the end of the day, and, and going back to your question about HIPAA being um, changed, there's nothing more personal than a patient's illness and a family and their interaction with health care. And although we have the power of personalizing care using technology and information and crowdsourcing getting right information better, quicker. We also have to be very thoughtful that it is still very personal. And not all of us necessarily want to have our data in the cloud. And so as we go on this new journey together, and I think we'll find a nice medium 
we're going to have some bumps and hiccups along the road. And be very thoughtful as you hear conversations like, you know, we should make it all available. We should make it none available. There's going to have to be a, a really difficult conversation the country's going to have is what is personal, what should be personal, and what can be public, and, uh, and then go from there. Because at the end of the day, it really is a personal journey that we each of us go through, and we each go through different ways. And so if any, if any social media can be helpful, be the doctor and patient collaborative, great, great. If people don't want to do that, I think it's fine. But if you really want to take the dive, I just say just do it and be very thoughtful about how you go about it. Um, with that, I think that wraps it up. I would like to make one quick plug, and that is tomorrow is World Diabetes Day, and that there are free diabetes screenings at Sleep Train Arena from 11 to 4. So anybody who wants to come. And uh, I'd like to thank the panel and the social media group. All right, so thank you very much. This is obviously uh, and very interesting and sort of like evolving subject matter um, that uh, I think we all want to keep our eyes on and, and, and plug into. Uh, with that note, I always want to say that this isn't the end of the conversation. The Social Media Club, uh, we like to keep the conversation going. There's already a ton of great uh, tweets going on about this panel. Um, you can see your accounts have blown up uh, while you've been here talking. Um, but yeah, keep that. We've got the SMC SAC hashtag. We've got the healthcare uh, and social media hashtag going along with tonight's conversation. Please, let's, let's keep this going because it's a great conversation. That's one that's going to be going on uh, for the foreseeable future. Um,